Thank you. Kids can make their way to Children's Church if you have a four-year-old uh, fourth grade, fifth grade. And uh, what is it? Fourth grade. And uh, if you'd like your kids stay in, in with you, that's okay too. Today's topic, we're in Joshua. We're kicking off Joshua. And I just love that we get into a story really quick in this book. And a, the, um, the title today is a, um, is a Hapchuckism. A Hapchuckism is a phrase that is usually unique to Dave Hapchuck. I have a running list now on my phone. Isn't there somebody else that's doing that? Yeah, yeah there was. There was somebody else that I heard is doing the same thing. Whenever he says something um, that's a Hapchuckism, I usually write it down. And so here's, the, here's a classic. It's not meant to be funny. It's not. It's just what it is. Um, well, one of them is uh, never struggle alone. That's, that's a big one. That's on a huge piece of stone at your property. The other one is scars to stars. Scars to stars. And we'll just be talking about something going on in somebody's life, and then he'll mention the principle, the idea that God will take your scars and turn them into stars. Well, it's, it's kind of like it'd be nice in cross-stitch, if anyone cross-stitches anymore. Did anyone do that? Anyone maybe over 90 that still cross-stitches? You know, they put it in your, wasn't that like a big deal, like a pillow, a cross-stitch pillow? Um, scars to stars. Today's story is so perfect, because watch what it's saying. Here's, here's the general idea of it, is he takes the scars of your life, Hate to jump in really quick, multiple marriages, uh, illnesses, mental disorder and mental uh, problems, uh, physical problems, uh, your, your family gene pool, it might be so bad that it needs lots of chlorine. That's how bad your gene pool is. So you just look back at all the stuff in your life, things that you've done, things that have happened to you, what you call a scar, your scars some of which nobody knows. Others are so obvious, and they're your scars. They're who you are. The principle is God doesn't take the scar and remove it. That's what the world would have you do through counseling and everything, is, and that's what alcohol is for, is to forget the past. That's why we run from things, because we want to get rid of the scars. God is so far greater than that. He doesn't want to get rid of the scars. He wants to turn the scar into a star. Philosophically, this is huge because what it's saying is it's not there on accident. This wasn't a mistake. And you're like, oh, you should have been there. Oh, it was a mistake. No, it was your mistake. But God uses that and turns that into a strength of yours. And I'm going to tell you, that's hard to do. That takes a lot of time to allow the sensitivity and pain like it happened yesterday and it could have been decades ago. Still hard to think about. God intends for that to be a star. Early on, all we want to do is get rid of it. If only that hadn't happened. If I could just get rid of this. Today's topic with Rahab is a scar-to-star -star topic. It's a remarkable... To think that right out of the shoots of the book of Joshua, this, everything's been leading up to this moment. They're out of Egypt... They make their way all the way to cross into the promised land. And they go, uh, I don't think we can do it. All right, that's fine. Wander for 40 years. Now we're here again. This is it. This is literally the taking of the promised land. If there's anything more contemporary than that, it's we're, we're seeing it in the news every day. Whose land is it? Who wants them eliminated from the river to the sea? Well, that's the promise. It goes all the way back to this moment when they are about to cross in and start taking the land. 
This is 1400 B.C. So they send two spies over. Let's check out our first, our first battle. Because it's sitting right there. You could see it. Remember I told you last week when you're on Mount Nebo in Jordan, as we've been many times looking out over, you can see Jericho right there. You can see the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. You could even see Jerusalem. And right in front of you is Jericho. You've got to take Jericho. It's the first thing. This is it. This is the big battle. And what's the story about? A heroine. A woman that if not for her scars, she would not have been the hero. She had to have those scars in order to be a hero of the story. And here we have crossing into the promised land, crossing the Jordan, taking their first prize city, the hero of the story is a woman with scars that everybody could see. All of Israel's promised land was contingent. It was hanging in the balance because of her. This is unbelievable. <clears throat> like all of our preparation, 40 years wandering, and now it's all at stake with her. Yeah, and thank the Lord for her scars. So grateful for her past. Because if not for the past, there wouldn't be the star. There wouldn't be the beginning of the conquering of the promised land. So take a look. If you have a Bible, I wish you do. <clears throat> you can bring it up on your phone, but I'd, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd love it if you have a, a paper a copy there. But Joshua chapter 2, it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, that's like every kid Bible story joke, who in the Bible had no parents, it's Joshua. He's the son of Nun. Sent two men secretly from Shatiam as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. Some translations will say harlot. Only because it's an old English word, it means the exact same thing. There really is no controversy as to what she was. Uh, some commentaries in Judaism, they, they will call her like an innkeeper. It's kind of you think of an old western, the brothel. That's it. In fact, the old western mentality, that is the picture. They're going, and they're going straight to that place, and we'll kind of talk in a moment of why that was such an ideal location for them. In Rahab and Lodge there, verse 2, and it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, true, the men came to me, but I don't know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she actually had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in or on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as pursuers had gone out. So get the picture here. They're only they're six miles from the Jordan. It, it, Location-wise, it's, it's five miles north of the Dead Sea. It's 15 miles. If you go 15 miles, you have Jerusalem. Five, six miles this way, you've crossed the Jordan River, and you're in the country of Jordan. It is a prime location. This is the city this is the one that everyone needs to cut through in trade routes. This is the place. And they arrived, they entered the house of a prostitute. Hmm, why would you go there? No, no, don't think that way. No, no, not that. Why? At the, 
That's, I mean, it went like deliberately there. So think of the old western town. You're riding into town, and you're scoping the place out. You want to know what's going on. You're not going to the saloon and seeing who plays, who's playing poker. You're going to the house of disrepute. You're going there. Uh, you'll less likely be noticed as a newcomer. And it's kind of like this is where all the gossip happens. This is where you get to learn anything you want to learn. It's here. This is where you could kind of blend in. And that's where they ended up. But the woman had taken the two men and hid them. Okay, so much at stake. The two spies have been waiting 40 years for this. All they have to do is go in, yeah, let me give you a few details, we've got it, it's fine, and go tell them. They get in, and as soon as they get there, people find out. You know, there's spies from that huge group across the river. And they're like, how did we blow this so quick? This is unbelievable. Like, we're caught this fast. And she says, oh, I've got you. Go up and hide underneath of all of that. I've got it. I I want a quick lesson right off the bat. When you think you're in a situation that is hopeless, God has people. It's not hopeless. Oh, the the insurance company, the struggle that I'm having within this huge... God has people. He has people everywhere. He had people there. This is unbelievable. It was over. So relax. It's okay. God has this. God can do it, and he will do it. In a relationship, in your job, in something that's going on, God has people, and this is a great example of that. And take specific notice again that she was a prostitute. Okay, got to get this. God didn't use her in spite of the fact that she had scars. God used her because of her scars. God didn't use her and overlook this past of her, not past, the present of her, didn't overlook all that and say, I'm going to use you anyway. No, it's because of where she was, God was able to use her. The church lady if there would have been one there, the church lady was not the one going to be used in the story. She was in bed at 7.30 watching Lawrence Welk. She's of no use to us in the story. We needed somebody out late. We needed somebody in the wrong place. So your life may have been uh, misdirected over time. It's how you see it. It was misdirected. You're in how many marriages? And you're like, I am so second, third, fourth class. Or past experiences have redirected you, and you're like, I can't even believe I am where I am. And somehow convinced that because of those scars, I'm destined for this place, which is low, Oh, but God could use me anyway. No. No. It's all right. It's all good. The scars are useful. The scars become the stars. A friend of mine I contact periodically, he worked with NASCAR, and he was one where he... uh, He was heading towards the 76 Olympics, and he ran 140 miles a week. That was his normal routine. And uh, he took a joint. He was in college, and it was laced with something. And it ruined him. So he lost the Olympics. He becomes an airline pilot. They find out that he's taken a drug to overcome that problem he had, lost his airline pilot's license, Married three times. And I remember sitting with him. I remember it was yesterday. We were riding down the road. I said, Brad, what in the world? I mean, if you can go back and change anything, 
what's the first thing you'd change? He said, nothing. I wouldn't change any of it because it got me to where I am today. This is where I am today, and I wouldn't be here today if not for. Do you see that? It's not in spite of, it's because of. That's so important. You don't like something that happened to you as a child. None of us liked it. We're all furious with you, and we'll even cry with you about it. We're v- but God is so great that he takes that as a scar in your life, and he makes it your star. He's able to do in your life and through you, with you, like you could never have done otherwise. Take a look at verse 18. Uh, I, still, I still can't believe, or verse 8. It says, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, okay, remember who she is. This is a Canaanite, it's a Canaanite um, uh, nationality. Cities then acted as their own uh, country. So it would be a king of Nineveh. Whenever you read those kind of things, that's not that impressive. There's thousands of people, but it's a walled city, and your walled city is your kingdom. And so they're all Canaanite, but they acted independently. And so here she was as a prostitute, probably a little bit of a... Uh, an inn associated, uh, yes, restaurant-ish, there's food, it's that type of thing. This is her. In verse 8, said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you came out from Egypt. That was 40 years earlier. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, were on that side of the Jordan, uh, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heavens above and on earth beneath. If you didn't know, that's like a prophet. How did she get to this point You say, well, but she heard all the stories. Oh, no, everyone heard all the stories. But she heard the stories, and she actually stated as a testimony to those two, we believe in your God. Your God is the God over the heavens and over the earth below. This this gave these guys the confidence they needed that God really is in this. The power of her words... that were more meaningful because of who she was. It's the coworker that's struggling to stop and give a deliberate statement. Hey, just so you know, we think the world of you. And walk away. The power of these words coming from her We, st- we still, still tell the story all the time. We're sitting there in the subway. Grant was this tall. He's standing there with his blind cane. I'm standing next to him with a map in a dark subway, clearly not knowing where we were going. And a hoodlum comes by, a real live New York City hoodlum. I mean, it was the real deal. I mean, he walked up and glanced at me, and I wanted to go, oh, hey, hang on a second. Here, take my wallet. Oh, you can have him. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, we're good. Like, I mean, it was that quick. I mean, that's like, I look, and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad Grant can't see what's going on right now. And he stopped and looked at me, and with the nicest voice, are you lost? Oh, no, I'm not lost. <laughs> no, I'm just heading over to Manhattan with my boy. And he laughed. He goes, no, actually, you're heading to Coney Island. Hmm? He goes, oh, yeah, if you're getting on this subway, you're going to Coney Island. He was the nicest kid in the world. 
I said, so what do you suggest we do? And he goes, yeah, I would go back out, go around the street, and come on to the other side. You're going to end up in Manhattan. And I said, so am I paying twice? <laughs> and he goes, that's funny. Uh, well, actually, you could probably talk to them up there. They're probably, they're pretty cool about it. Is that great? Okay, this was, he was in uh, maybe junior high or freshman in high school. He's 27 right now. So we're talking about 10 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday because I needed that voice. I needed somebody to say something. She had something going on in her heart and life that God was personally massaging in her. There's no other place it could come from. It's not from the Word. There wasn't one for her. There's no Bible kicking around. There was no preacher. God was working in her heart. She goes up, and she has two guys completely at her mercy. She has Israel at her mercy. And she goes up and she says, hey, you need to know. You're here to spy us out. Let me tell you what's going on. We are scared. We've heard the stories. Oh, really? Like recent? Oh, no. Forty years ago. We know how you got out of Egypt. Like, you know that? Oh, yeah. We all know. And, by the way, your God is God. He's God in the heavens, and he's God down here be below the power of words. I want to encourage you that way yourself. If you have power in words, and if you don't feel like you're so qualified, it almost makes them more powerful because you didn't expect it. For a young person to go say to another young person who's struggling, some word of encouragement, some word of I'm partnering with you through this. The power of words. The last is that she, her faith, she was rewarded for beyond, far beyond any imagination. So if you look at the passage in verse 14, this is Joshua 2, and the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, you will deal kindly and faithfully with us. Then we look over, finally, it's not until chapter 6, the middle of the story, the famous story of Jericho. What's in the middle of the story? Rahab and family. Oh, but it's so much bigger than that. The blessing of Rahab. You look, you all familiar with uh, Hebrews 11? Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. They call it the Hall of Faith. And it just runs through all the Old Testament of great people of faith. <laughs> this is awesome. Rahab's in it. Joshua isn't. <laughs> like, are you? <laughs> I bet Joshua read that. And he goes, Really? Hey, I'm all a fan of Rahab and all. I met her. She's a great gal. But serious, out of everything I had to put up with, I'm the one that took him over. I'm the one that did all this, and she has a section in the Hall of Faith, and Joshua doesn't. That's remarkable. Because God's lens is different than our lens. Her act of faith was literally her entire life, her family's life, everything was at stake. And she said, no, you know what? This is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. He may not even believe me. She goes, why would they believe me? The faith of her conviction in Hebrews 11, it's bigger than that. Many of you know it's bigger than that. You could trace the line of David which is also then extends as the line of Jesus. She's in it. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Are you serious? Oh, yeah, she folded right in to the people, and she's in the line of David in the line of Jesus. How about that for a blessing? 
you may know there's four, five if you include Mary, there's four named people, women, in the line of Jesus. A couple of them are pretty scarred. Well, they're non-Jewish. The line of Jesus, they're not even Jewish. They're not even Israelite. They're blood from outside, folded into this thing. Because she's that amazing. We were, um, I don't know why I, I do this, but I, I count, like, I count verses, I even like to count words for space. How much space is given for each thing? The story of Jericho, which doesn't happen until chapter 6. This is chapter 2 because they got that pep talk at the beginning, meditate so that you can obey and be prosperous. Then it's the story of Rahab. Then they all have to gather and get ready and get themselves set to cross the Jordan. And then finally, they take Jericho. So Jericho is chapter 6, Rahab is chapter 2. Combined, the two chapters, I believe it's 58 verses. Jericho's not really in the chapter 2. It's all Rahab. Chapter 6, in the middle, is Rahab again. Pull those verses, add it to all of those of chapter 2, the infamous story of Jericho that Joe Sixpack down the road knows the story of Jericho. Everyone knows. You've seen, watch one veggie tale. You know the story of Jericho. Everyone knows the story of Jericho. And yet, when it's recorded in the Bible, there is more text on Rahab than there is on Jericho. That's amazing to me. We'll see this over and over and over. God is about people. God is about loving you and convincing you, don't change to come to God. Please don't change. Don't try to clean up to go. To, go to God exactly the way you are. And his arms are out and going, I just want you. I just want to be with you. I'm not here to build a nation. America's a Christian nation, was a Christian. God doesn't work through nations. He works through people. And even back in the Old Testament, when he was building up the people of his own in order to produce the Messiah of Jesus, even when it was about a nation, it was even then about people. God loves you so much not in spite of what you've done or what you've experienced. He loves you because of what you've done, what you've experienced. And not only do we have then the privilege of being with God through faith in Jesus Christ just the way we are, we then can become that spokesperson to use our words in the lives of people around us. Let me end with one, uh, one last idea. Uh, September 10th, uh, September 10th, uh, George Sweeting passed away. Does anyone know who that is? Really? It's okay, he's dead now. So, you've missed your chance. <laughs> George Sweeting was uh, for 30 years uh, president of Moody Bible Institute, pastor of the church, um, he is, he's quite an amazing uh, guy. Uh, he died at age 99. So uh, 1924, 2024. He just passed this week. I just texted. In fact, I got a text while I was sitting there from Brad Williams. We heard him speak, and my buddy Brad didn't want to be there to hear this old guy speak. And so <laughs> George Sweeting's so cool. We afterwards... Uh, we were helping host it. So afterwards, George Sweeting is walking down, and he's got kind of a Billy Graham feel to him. And he's walking, and my buddy Brad, who was uh, mid-20s, he said, um, he goes, uh, Dr. Sweeting, I brought a book to read. 
I had no idea. You were amazing. And he says, sweetie, he had his microphone. He goes, uh, what's your name, son? He goes, my name's Brad. All right, Brad, take care of this mic for me, would you? And he kept walking. <laughs> we laughed so hard that that was like his response. Sweeting's like the man. George Sweeting in the early 1950s was actually standing, uh, and I heard him tell the story. It was a small group of us. I'm standing or sitting right there listening. In the 1950s, George Sweeting with a group of newly graduated college kids at 10 Downing Street in London. Who lives at 10 Downing Street? The Prime Minister, right? For those that thought it might be um, Sherlock Holmes. He lives at what? Really? We don't know Sherlock Holmes fans? Those are the two addresses we should know. He's standing at 10 Downing Street, George Sweeting. He's standing there, and he starts delivering in an accent a uh, Winston Churchill speech. <laughs> and his college students are all around, and he's delivering this boisterous speech, and the door opens. And Winston Churchill walks out. And this, I'm, I mean, we're, and there's history in front of me. There's George Sweeting telling the story, and George Sweeting freezes stands at attention, and Winston Churchill says, do you know more? He goes, sir, I know all of your speeches by heart. He goes, well, then continue. And George uh, Sweeting gave the speech while Winston Churchill stood there and listened. Let me tell you the powerful words of a Winston Churchill. Listen to these words. We shall never surrender or fail. We shall go to the end. We shall fight in France, and we shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight in the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Winston Churchill. He changed the mood of the war. It was shifted because of his speech, of his words. Words change history. Words change lives. And when you feel like you're an unsuspecting tool used by God, that is so far even better that they didn't even see it coming. They had no idea that you come up alongside of them and say a few words of confidence, say a few words of encouragement. Rahab was not hung up on the fact of her career. Rahab was above and beyond it, and the truth is we now know if not for the fact of her career, she would never even have interacted with those two guys. She needed to be who she was. And when you and I leave ourselves available in the hands of God, no matter who we are, we can do what God can do. Let's pray together. Let's bow in prayer. Heads bowed, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can today. Don't clean up your life. Don't straighten anything out. God loves you exactly as you are right now. And you could turn to him eyes are bowed, heads bowed, eyes closed, and you can just quietly, between you and God, you can say, Heavenly Father, I need you. Thank you for creating me the way I am. I trust you for my eternal life. I believe that you died for me. Thank you for saving me in loving me the way I am. And Heavenly Father, for those that just prayed with me, what a great moment to walk into your arms as, as our Savior. And now, Heavenly Father, as we enjoy time together, that we have opportunity in the next hour to share words of encouragement, the powerful words to build and encourage one another up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.